You're listening to the best of the bravest. Interviews with the FDNY's elite. I had this great newsletter and the archive. I'm glad that the archive is still up so that we can go back and read about some of the things that he wrote, some of the jobs that he personally chronicled. August of 1997. There was a really bad fire. I don't know if you remember this job. You and Dennis Mojica were on this one. You know the job I'm talking about? Building collapse. Yes. Tell, take me through that one. Uh, again, whatever it was, two in the morning, uh, we get a run, report of a collapse. We, we've heard that hundreds of times. You know, Most times it was a ceiling. You know, It might be a water leak in the bathroom on the apartment above. Sheetrock comes down. But every now and then... It would turn into a, uh, you know, a legitimate collapse. So anyway, we that was Flatlands Avenue, Flatlands and Flatbush. So we, we were coming down Utica Avenue on our way, with Utica to uh, Kings Highway, Kings Highway to Flatbush. Very quick run, especially at that time of day. And all of a sudden, we hear the first two engine, their chauffeur transmitting a, a 1060 for a major collapse and we could hear the building coming down over the radio and that kind of wakes you up a little bit you know so uh, we uh we pulled up and a whole wing one wing of the building is actually collapsed into the street fifth floor it was a five-story building i think it was just collapsed right into the street uh, and the chief is telling us that uh, on one of the upper floors, there's a civilian that's trapped. And we went up, went up the stairs. And when you're in the hallway of this apartment building, you had no idea anything was going on. I mean, clear as a bell, no smoke, no dust, no, no anything. Uh, looked down the hallway, and sure enough, the way that the collapse had occurred, the I-beam was exposed. Everything was shifting out to the street, very long, narrow hallway, and I can kind of make out the civilian. Turned out it was an older gentleman, 70s, maybe early 80s. Uh, they woke him up, you know, by the cops. Listen, the first four cops on the scene, they really did a great job evacuating that building. Uh, then, the you know, the first two companies showed up, and uh, I guess everybody who was there at that moment did a great job in getting everybody out. Unfortunately, this gentleman stopped to put his shoes on. And while he was putting on his shoes, the building came down. He was trapped. Uh, I was able to work my way down the hallway uh, across the I-beam, got to the guy, but, but he was pretty stuck. I uh, was able to get a sawzall, battery-powered sawzall. There was a, uh, a wooden bookcase. I was able to cut that away. But as you cut it away, the guy's weight, just his momentum, he started heading for Flopish Avenue. So I was kind of like bent over the back of the couch, holding him in a very awkward position. And I just wasn't able to get any leverage to pull him back up to get him out of the building. Uh, Dennis was our boss that night. He was, uh, at that point, he got uh, promoted out of Rescue 2. He was a lieutenant in Rescue 1. He was working an overtime tour in Rescue 2. So, And like I said, I know Dennis from 1979, 1980, when he was in 120. And I was just like, listen, boss, I need a little help. And he was able to crawl down the hallway, lean over me, get the gentleman by under his arms, and pull him up over my head. I was able to get his feet, and then we were able to work our way out of there. But... uh yeah, it was, that was an interesting collapse. That was pretty good. And they happen often, unfortunately, in New York City because they're always building something. You know, I know that day the, the marshals, everybody was really caught off guard by it. But uh, where were you? And, and take me through your steps getting down there. And, and while you do that, I'll show some pictures that you sent me of um, what you captured. Well, I came. My wife actually tried to, to talk me out of uh, going to work that day because it's my birthday. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, nah, I got to go to work. I have something to do with Bobby Burns. I have I have things to do. So I usually leave early for work. And I got there and checking my cameras, as I usually do, batteries, things like that. And somebody said the uh, 
a, a small plane hit the trade center. And I went to the front of the building because we overlook, we could see the trade center. We overlook the Navy yard. I go to the front and I said, it's not a little plane. If we can see the opening from here. And then as we were watching it, the second plane hit the building. And Bobby Burns is calling me, let's go. We got to go get your cameras, get your stuff. And uh, we went up over the bridge onto the FDR. We came out in front of the, uh, the, the uh, right under the, out of the tunnel and onto West Street. And we parked in front of the, uh, the club, you know, the, uh, and we walked up the street and there was bodies and plane parts uh, all over the street. And as we got up to uh, Liberty Street and the overpass, uh, Bob says, run, run. And we heard this horrific noise, you know, the sound like a freight train coming. And uh, I'm a big guy. I don't run fast. Uh, I just laid down on the ground and pulled my coat up like the old timers told me. Uh, my friend, uh, <laughs> God bless him. Uh, Bob Bob Beckwith, he said, in the old days, if you pull your coat up over your nose, and you can have some air to breathe. So that's what I did, and I just stayed there until I could. I couldn't even see. You could not even see your hand up in front of your face until it cleared. And everybody was like, so what do you think? And I was sort of like, come on, you know, like... <laughs> I was enjoying my sort of hangout, like figure my life out kind of time. And I came home and I told my husband, I said, oh, you know, these guys all called me and, and um, they really want me to take this job. And I was like, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. And then I then I kind of paused and I was like, what am I, an idiot? Like, of course, I'm going to take this job. I mean, I have it was like a no brainer. You know, um, I had sort of joked when I went to uh, grad school. For public, I went to get my master's in public administration. And I, even when I was in grad, grad school, I said to people who asked me, why are, you in, why are you in grad school? And I was like, well, I don't really want to be like 50 something standing on a street corner telling people that it's snowing. Like that just seems like something that I would outgrow. Do I love reporting? Of course, but like just, you know, what the tra trajectory was. And I was like, ah, I, you know, I, I know if I want to, um, you know, I'm always interested in city, city government. I love the fire department. I don't know. <laughs> If I want to do anything in of any you know substance, I'll have to have a managerial um, master's anyway. So I was like, ah, I'll probably just. And I said it like a million times. I was like, I'll probably just go work for the fire department, whatever. And I just kind of blew it off. And then there was like on a like a platter, and I was like, Ugh. and so it it was it was sort of serendipitous, but also just kind of amazing that it worked out the way that it did because um, it it's, it is in many ways a very natural extent, extension for the, the kind of stuff I was doing before because I was so connected. Um, there was re really very little transition for me because um, I haven't, I already speak the language. I already know I have enough institutional knowledge for my coverage um, from New York One. And also just like, you know, my brother is still active. Um, many of, I have many friends who are still ha active. Several of my girlfriends are married to firefighters. Um, and, and it just, it was, it's just, I hate to say like, it's just been easy, but it's just been easy. And, and I feel like that's a blessing because I enjoy it and, and it's fun and it really doesn't feel like work. And I didn't really, I wasn't fully confident that that would happen again because I'd ha always had that kind of career at New York one where it didn't feel like work. It just was like kind of fun. And, and this is kind of an extension of that. And I feel really grateful for that. So it's, it's been a good thing. That fit. brings us to the summer of 1998. You know, you were in rescue one by this point for about a year. And we have, you know, there's a lot of construction in New York City. There always is. There always will be. We have a 40-foot crane that falls in Manhattan. And these things are always a hazard. If there's storms, sometimes they'll sway. Maybe a water main break destabilizes. It's always a concern because we've seen some horrendous tragedies where they collapse, they take out a block, and more tragically, they injure, if not kill people. And in this collapse, you're talking with, you're talking about a wide array of damage in such a compact space like Midtown. And on top of that, it's July. It's sweltering hot in the city, which doesn't make things any easier. Take me through the response to that. We were in quarters at the time and, and the box came over for a crane collapse. And we, we knew the crane was operating, you know, it was right uh, two blocks from the firehouse actually. Uh, we responded, we got there right as Battalion 9 was uh, pulling into the block. 
I reported into Chief Nardone at the time. And just you know, said, "Rescue, you know, we're here, Chief. What can we do?" He goes, uh, "Take a look, size up. Let me know what's going on." And uh, he goes, "So I transmit a 1060." I said, "Yes, definitely transmit a 1060 for uh, you know, um, collapse rescue type of thing. Uh, get uh, the additional rescue company special operations there as well." And the way it was was a uh, crane elevator going up one side of the building and the crane on top, and it separated from the building at the top end of it, went across the street. Uh, crashed into a roof of the building across the street, and the weight itself planted itself in the middle of the block by about three or four feet into the ground. Uh, the first thing I saw was the separation of the elevator on the uh, building into construction that I knew we had to secure that. So I told my guys, grab the rigging, grab the rope, grab the grip boys, left one guy at the rig to make sure we need any, if we need any more equipment. Uh, we went, reported to the you know, construction guys, I said, I need to get upstairs. They got us upstairs, sized up what we needed to tie off, and I had the guys start rigging up the the, uh, the hoist itself and, and tying it back off to the building uh, using ropes and the grip and secure the two top ends of it and, uh, you know, getting as much as we want, uh, as, as secure as we could before it, and it fell any further. Uh, Chief Downey at the time came up and said, you know, keep on doing what you're doing. He goes, I have other rescue companies coming in, and I believe he had the uh, – one rescue company uh, assigned to the building across the street. Actually, it was one fatality on the uh, top floor there where the crane came through and, and, and actually killed a woman there. Uh, so it was, they were doing a the search there. We were still securing up. And, and then we had you know, a couple of the other companies coming up and help us out. But it was basically for us, the rescue, just securing our end and making sure that the rest of the, uh, the crane wouldn't uh, fall into anybody else in the street or destroy any more buildings across the street. So July of 98 is when engine 288 becomes mm -hmm. squad 288 mm -hmm. and this is being formed and you're a charter member. So it doesn't happen overnight. Kubler, you're off the squad. There's a process. Take me through the right. process of getting into SOC when you first heard they were going to form. Well, at that time, uh, you, you go, they, they posted something in the orders and there was a tryout. They wanted you to go out down there to the rock and the captains of the new squads were basically standing around a clipboard and they were running you through different evolutions, climbing the aerial, uh, stretching a line. I can't remember what they all were, but they were sitting around watching you. And uh, it was at the end of the day, they, they jotted down names that they liked and they all sat at a big table and it was like choosing up your baseball team. They went around a circle. I'm going to take this guy. I'm going to take this guy. They also had their picks. You know, there was guys like Hank Bollet, senior guy. He didn't try it out. There was other guys who they brought over. They had a couple of guys that they could bring over, you know, and then they picked from the uh, younger guys. And also, you know, 288, I think we only had one guy that stayed from the original engine 288, but there was other guys like in 270, they may have had like six, seven, eight guys, you know, squatty engine 18, six, seven, eight guys that wanted to stay. They offered it to the guys who were there first. And if they wanted to stay, they could stay. Um, but in 288, there was really only one guy that stayed, uh, Anthony Tito. And uh, the rest of the guys were all new guys. So that, that brings up two, two different things there. So you have the old engine, it, let, let's say 18, because they had more guys. You had the old guys from engine 18, who more or less would say, well, this is engine 18, this is how we do it. You got all these new hard charges coming in like, yo, Jack, this ain't engine 18. This is squad 18. And this is how we're going to do it. And that created a lot of animosity, man. A lot of rifts. I know a lot of those guys were eventually weeded out because uh, there's a lot of button heads going on. For us, we really didn't have that, man. Uh, we all came in. We're all on the same page. All just wanted to go to work. All couldn't wait. Drilled to uh, 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, we knew what we were signing up for, and, and basically, that's what we went there for. You know, it was a different mishmash of guys, but uh, I, I tell this story all the time. So I didn't get picked uh, when I went down there. Louis, I think Louis, Nicky Corrado got picked. A couple other guys got picked. So Louis, uh, you know, on, about to go there, and um, he says, "Why don't you come down and see the captain? Talk to him, see what he says." So I said, right, "I'll go down there. I go down, see the captain." He's like, oh, Kev, you know what? I'll keep your name around. You know, I have a lot of young guys. I really don't need another guy with, you know, three, four years on the job. I got a lot of those guys, you know. I said, okay, keep me in mind, Cap. So when I came back, the captain of 16 truck was a guy named Mike Puzaferi. He was my workout partner. He was a hard charger. He was a great fireman, fireman up in Vinegar Hill, uh, a lieutenant in Vinegar Hill. 
uh, he says, what happened? You know, and he, I used to like working with him because he knew I liked to drill all the time. So I said, he says, what happened? I says, oh, the captain said he got a lot of young guys. I said, all right. He says, do you really want to go there? I go, yeah, I do. But, you know, I can wait my turn. I think two days later, he must, <laughs> I don't know who he called. Two days later, Captain Murphy calls me back. He goes, hey, Kev, uh, I got a call uh, on your behalf. Uh, you want to come down and start on Saturday? He goes, I go, yeah. He goes, all right, come in and see me tomorrow and fill out the paperwork. I was like, yeah, Cap, I was in there like two, day, <laughs> two days ago. You know, he goes, oh, that was you? All right, start on Saturday. <laughs> so I think I must have left a really good impression on him, man. You know, like he didn't even remember that I went to see him two days before. But uh, that's basically how I got over there, man. And Louie had, I think Louie worked the very first day, and I came there like the second or third day. Something down like at the Trade Center. What was the plan of attack for you and your crew? You know, what was the size up process like? What, what, what were you telling the guys? Well, I, I you know, we got the uh, the order. We, we went on the third of all home, and, and we got down there, and the the building was burning. And uh, basically, it was going to be a standard operating procedure in my head. We had to get to the seat of the fire and put the fire out. It was no different than any other job. It wasn't like we were at something a spectacular. It turned into a spectacular event, of course, with the collapse of the building. But that's when we arrived there. It was just it was another burning building. It just happened to be, you know, of course, famous buildings, uh, well-known buildings. But they were burning. There were fires in the, in the buildings, and we had to put those fires out. And that's that was what's going on in my head. Mm. You know? Which stairwell will you, you ended up taking stairwell B primarily, but I, I know at some point when the other one came down, South Tower came down, it was a combination of Chief Gancy, the chief of the department, and Chief Joe Pfeiffer, who later went on to run the uh, FDNY's counterterrorism division when it was uh, uh, insulated to the department in 2002, I believe, that issued the Mayday order to evacuate the building. I'm assuming that at that point, you guys heard that order and began the descent down, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. We, we, that is correct. We got the order to May Day uh, to, to uh, evacuate the building, and we started down. Exactly. That's what you do. You follow orders, you know. Of course. On the, on the way down, some guys, I remember a couple of guys from ESU talking about this, that, you know, the stairwell they were in by that point, they were able to make a rapid descent down because there was nobody in it to have left to, that was coming down to evacuate. So they got out with more than enough time, given they were the only ones in the stairwell. Other stairwells were a bit more crowded. Guys were meeting resistance on the way up and then on the way back down because of the amount of people coming down uh, and that they had to get out of there. For you, was your stairwell crowded, or did you have, at, to, at least until 1028, a relatively clear shot down? No, I don't remember there were being crowded. Uh, there were there were a number of civilians in the stairway coming down with us, but uh, I don't In fact, one of the, uh, the people coming down, Josephine, actually got stuck with us from the... Uh, Josephine Harris. Uh, in, yeah, Josephine. Yeah, so there were civilians there, uh, but there weren't that many of them. I think most of them had already gotten out of the building. Thank God. No. Mm -hmm. So when do, when nine fifty nine a.m. to just go back to that for a second, when the other building came down, I mean, you felt the rumble. I'm sure who wouldn't if they're in, if they were in your position. Did you know right away what that was, given your twenty five years of experience at that point? Uh, no, I didn't know exactly what it was. What I thought at first, when the, the, the stairway started rumbling, I thought the building we were in was starting to come down. I thought there was maybe a partial collapse or something. Something was going on. I didn't know the other building had come down. Hmm. Uh, I just found it a later, of course. But... Uh, but my very first thought was there was something occurring in the building I was in. Because that's how, that's how it was a strong a shake. It wasn't just a little rumble. It was a pretty strong shake. Uh, well, we'll let tonnage coming down. Of course, it's going to shake the ground that way. But I did not know it was South Tower coming down. So I found that out later. So at 1028, as you and the guys, uh, Chief Jay Jonas and his team, are on the way back down. He wasn't chief at the time, of course. I believe he was a lieutenant. 
or captain, actually a captain. Uh, yeah, he was a captain. Yeah, yeah, he was a captain at the time. The building comes down, and, and as I said before, and I'll link it in the description of this video on when it goes on YouTube. Dennis, uh, excuse me, uh, Dennis Smith's documentary, uh, 2002's report from Ground Zero, and particularly the part where you talk about your survival. You're in stairwell B. You survived this collapse uh, amazingly. You know, and then there's that process in which these guys are trying to figure out first where you guys are because of the, the magnitude of the devastation and then the work subsequently to get you and your men. And, of course, Chief Jonas is, is men as well as Josephine Harris out of there during that process as they worked to look for you. Uh, take me through just trying not to panic as you're in this confined space and unsure if you are going to be rescued. Well, I, I was, for a while, I was alone, uh, totally alone. And uh, I was a, uh, on the fourth or something, the fourth or so floor, and there was nobody around me, and I didn't hear anything. I thought I was totally alone, which, which is uh, the frightening experience when you feel totally alone. And then after about 15 minutes or so, I heard voices. And there were other people in that stairway, and I heard their voice. And I believe me, that, that was a calming effect on me, the fact that there were other people there, other human beings. Uh, being alone is a terribly frightening thing, you know. When you're going through something bad and you have comrades, for some reason that brings you a comfort. I, I don't, I can't explain that. I'm not a psychologist, a uh, psychiatrist, stuff, but for some reason, the aloneness is a terrifying feeling, you know. Of course. There's no, you feel no around, but when you feel there's other, when you find out there's other people around for some reason, that calms you down. Uh, it makes you feel a little better. Well, nobody wants to go through plight or stressful situations in solitude. It's not the best way to handle those situations, and especially a situation like that. Of course, you'd like to have they call it? solitude. Why do they call it? Yeah. Solitary confinement when they punish a person, right? Exactly. It's a terrible, it's very frightening being alone. It really is. It's a whole different type of fear, you know. Uh, even though the situation is so dangerous around you, but when you're alone, that is a another awesome great fear. story about a fire. Another standby building in in Brownsville. Mm -hmm. We go over there. It's. Uh, it was a night tour. I think it was about. I'm, I'm work. I think it was about seven o'clock. Comes in fire. Uh, top floor, multi-story building, standpipe job again. So uh, we go there, we're second due, uh, 120 and 231 had the fire. So we get up there and 231's guys there, they're, they're, they're getting a line set up. We had their control guy said, all right, you move up. We'll get you straightened out here. The guy's hooking up to the standpipe. Uh, the guys are stretching the line to the door. I'm in the hallway. Um, I hear on the radio, uh, the roof guy's talking about, he's, there's six people at a window. And he's setting up for a roof rope rescue. I mean, this is like, this is way up there. I mean, 12th floor, 11th floor. And and the and meanwhile, the hallway's charged. So the lieutenant's calling him on the radio going, hold up, hold up. I think I think we're going to get it, you know. And I think in the, in the apartment, there was six in the back. There was like 11 people total in the apartment. So I'm in the hallway in the smoke, and they, they were ushering them past. I think the fire was in the kitchen. They were holding it. And getting the people out so the people could walk through. So I feel somebody bumping me. I feel somebody else bumping me. Uh, 231 gets water. We start their water. And I'm standing like up close to the, the apartment door in the smoke. And uh, all of a sudden on my turnout coat, I feel bang, bang, bang. Some, somebody pulling on my coat. You know, so what happens uh, initially, I'm like, I'm jumping, you know, I mean, what is, what is that? You know, I look down and, and the smoke clears a little bit and there's this little girl and I'm telling you, she couldn't have been more four or five. All right. I look down at her. She looks up at me and in a clear, calm voice, she says to me, Mr. Feynman, are we going to die tonight? I, I'm like, I hope not, sweetie. <laughs> I hope not. You know, and now I'm thinking to myself, Jesus, kid, I just started an hour. I got 14 more hours and you're asking me if I'm going to die tonight. You know, so I take her by the head. I said, come on me. I walk. I get her down, back down. I mean, this kid was as calm as can be. Maybe she had been into a fire before. I don't know. But she was calm as can be. 
So I walk her down the hallway. I get her back to the stairwell, and I turn her over to the the, the family that was in the apartment there. You know, I don't even I don't even know how she got out of the apartment. Where she walked out herself. I don't know what happened, but it was crazy. But I was just so happy that the men didn't see me walking hand in hand with her, because when we got back to the firehouse. You know where it would have been. Hey, you ought to see this four-year-old girl rescuing the lieutenant, taking him back to the stairwell. <laughs> but talk about out of the out of the mouths of babes. When she said that to me, I I, I was I, I couldn't believe it. I just said, I hope not, sweetie. I'm like, uh, you know, it's like it was at crazy. that age though. They're brutally honest. Oh my god! And she, you know, I, I it was funny because she was just below the smoke a little bit, and it cleared, and I see this little kid. And she was tiny. I'm telling you, it was just, I couldn't believe it, you know. Fortunately for the people in the apartment and the, the truck, they got the fire, the engine got the fire down. They didn't have to slide off the roof, thank God, you know, to try to rescue six people. And, um, you know, the truck, the engine, they did a great job, and they, they got the fire. And uh, But that was that was quite an event, uh, that, that little girl. And uh, that's something you, you never forget. You know, I, I, I can almost see her face looking up at me now and just uh, I'm like, really? <laughs> but uh, that was that was another night tour in, in 290 engine. 2001, of course, 9-11 occurs. And a third, I believe, of the department's 343 casualties were from SOC. The squads decimated every man working the rescues that day lost. You know, it was tough. And in the midst of this, you have the flight going down in uh, Rockaway, I believe, Flight 587. Then you mentioned the blackout in 2003, which wasn't terrorism, but nonetheless was a major emergency the city had to handle. And it was a rolling blackout, I believe. And in the midst of all this, you're trying to rebuild SOC, not from scratch, but definitely starting with, with the personnel that's left. That two-year period from 01 to 03, I don't know how else to ask the question. How did you juggle it? With a lot of help from my friends, Joe Cocker saw, you know, get by with a little help from my friends. And that's what it was. I mean, everybody knew it was all hands on deck. This is an emergency. I mean, everybody from manufacturers, equipment manufacturers, uh, agencies that gave us assistance. I mean, we needed all new rescue apparatus. I don't believe any of the rescue apparatus were able to be put back in service. Uh, so truck manufacturers put us in line and told other people, no, you got to wait. Yeah, I know you've got stuff on order. These guys are getting priority. Uh, equipment manufacturers did the same. Uh, the big challenges were personnel and training. Uh, we lost 95 people in special operations and the average time on the job was about 16 years for each of them. So we don't take probies out of the fire academy and put them into a squad or a rescue. Uh, you have to have experience. So we had to recruit. Uh, I didn't get involved in the company recruiting firefighters. That's the captain's responsibility. I told him, get your roster up you got to go back out there and you're going to have to recruit. You know, unfortunately, some of the busier truck companies, you know, you got five rescue companies looking to come take their personnel and they don't want to lose those people. Uh, so we had to kind of limit it. And I told them, you know, no more than three people from any company. Uh, so you got to spread the wealth. That was a, that was a challenge. My challenge was to get the officers uh, I that's that was my responsibility get replacement officers and that was tough uh, the first people that you would go to would be guys who had gotten promoted out of a rescue or a squad and some of them didn't want to come back or they wanted to come back I remember talking to a fellow and said I need you I need you to come back he says chief I would love to come back my wife will divorce me if I go back into SOC. You know, the families knew, like you said, you know, the rescue squads in Hazmat were wiped out to a man, except for one guy who was moving a rig. So they knew. And, you know, remember what else is going on that fall. Uh, that October, we started with the anthrax attacks. 
those were real. There were five real weapons grade anthrax attacks in New York City. This wasn't like the white powder runs that everybody else had. These were real dangerous attacks. So now, and who handles that? You know, that's a sock responsibility. And the families are well aware of what's going on. And they, they told them, you can't, if you go back there, I'm afraid we're going to lose you. I, I, I can't be married to you under those circumstances, waiting for you not to come home one night. So it was uh, very, very challenging to get people to step up. Fortunately, they did. You know, we got great, great people to step up. And, uh, but like some of them, uh, Bobby Morris, Bobby Morris is a great, great fire officer. He was a captain in ladder 28 up in Harlem. Uh, I known Bobby for 10 or 15 years. And when I said, I need the captain in rescue one, Bobby, would you take it? And he didn't want to go to rescue one. He was very, very happy up in 28 truck it was a great place. I said, Bobby, I need you. We need a great leader there. And he said, John, now, Bobby had very limited sock experience. He had been a firefighter in rescue three for a very short time. And he went back to, uh, I think it was 42 at the time because he missed the first two truck work. And uh, Rescue 3 wasn't doing any first two work because they were in a house with 45 truck. So they didn't do first do truck work like Rescue 1, Rescue 2, even 4 and 5. Bobby, please, please, please. I can teach you, you know, you're going to have those senior guys. You're going to have guys like Hash Hagen there. They know the technical stuff. I need you for your leadership. I need you for your presence on the fire ground. And Bobby stepped up. Uh, so many great people did step up. But that was, a, that was a, like you said, tough two years. 2001 to 2003 was uh, all hands on deck. I mean, 16, 17 hours a day at times. And I mean, six and seven days a week. So we got through it with a lot of help from our friends. And that's when we came into, you know, the first call we received was a boat in distress with people on the water. I think the first call into 911 came from probably, I think, a Parks Department uh, personnel there at Fort Totten, uh, tilled in, in uh, walkaways, where they heard screaming in the night, you know, voices in the, in the water going on. They went to investigate. And noticed a ship out just offshore and people coming ashore in, in, in from the water. That uh, started off the 9-11 call to all emergency services. We were in Brooklyn at the time. We were one of the two uh, dive rescues in uh, the FDNY, Rescue 5 and ourselves. I don't believe Rescue 4 was uh, scuba qualified at that time, but they had water capabilities for surface rescue. And the companies on each Rockaway, a lot of companies there themselves. So one of the things we looked at was, you know, getting a call. Normally, you know, at that time of year, Breezy Point, uh, Rockaways, it's that time of year, a lot of fishermen are out with their boats. They're getting their boats in the water for the first time. A lot of them are not used to, you know, going in the surf and, and you know, navigating the water. And we got a lot of boats running to the ground, into the jetties there. And normally throughout the summer, we got a lot of calls for persons in the water, persons in distress, or even boats in distress in that area. So we're not unfamiliar with that area. So the call came in probably about two o'clock, two thirty in the morning, for uh, for us as a normal you know boat sinking people in the water. Uh, that's the initial information we received in quarters, and at that time we just you know got on. We had a, you know divers on board already. Uh, I was driving that night, so just luckily for us, just head down Flatbush Avenue two o'clock in, in the morning. Very little traffic, so we made it there very quickly. Luckily, the uh, the the scene itself was right over on the other side of Rockaway, on the beach side, right opposite the Marine Parkway Bridge. So right down Flatbush Avenue over the bridge, we were right there. Uh, the first two companies in Rockaway were already in the, you know, on the beach, slicing things up. And as we got closer, reports started getting a little bit more detailed about a larger boat, larger vessel, with multiple people in the water. You know, going there, we still didn't know what was going on. You know, whether it was a small boat, a fishing boat, a fishing party boat, what type of boat it was. 
So, you know, until we got there and get eyes on ourselves, we really didn't know what we were uh, going to encounter when we was, you know, arrived on scene. Same story, though. Don't, don't leave it until, my friend. Okay. Oh, the, 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 the other story is I used to, after, after this occurred, and it's a true story, mm. I used to enjoy telling this story to other people in front of Ray Downey because he would get a kick out of it. And the, the story is we, it's the middle of the night. It's, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember really what season it was. But there was a fire off of 13th Avenue in the 50s. It was a Queen Anne going there. And we, we get there, there's reports of people trapped and whatnot. And Jerry O'Donnell, a legendary lieutenant from Ladder 147, he comes like stumbling out of the, the front door as, as we pull up and everything. And so, you know, Captain Downey took charge. He's, he's sending two guys up an aerial ladder. I think it was uh, Pete Bondi and uh, Bruce Howard. And... Uh, I said to Cap, I said, I'm going to head right up to the attic. He goes, like, go, go, go to the attic. So uh, I was going up to the attic, and, uh, and there was an engine. And going up to the attic, the stairs, like there was maybe about five stairs going up one way, and then five stairs going up the other way to the doorway to the attic. And there's a room on fire up there, and fire's like you know, lapping out of the doorway. So uh, I, an engine company had a a two and a half inch hose line stretch, but it was on charge. So I sort of, you know, I was going past him to go up to make the search in the uh, attic and the officer put his arm across the banister. He said, where are you going? I said, well, I got, I got to make a search up there. He goes, well, we don't have any water. I said, I don't care. I said, I got to make a search <laughs> up there. So well, like he goes, well, you, you can't go. I said, so I pushed his arm out of the way and he, he said to me, he goes, okay, go ahead, tough guy. See what you can do. So I got up to the top step. I get up my hands and knees and I, I crawl and the fire's in the back room. But like I said, it's lapping out across the ceiling and over the door. So I'm making a search of the front room and it's uh, the attic in this Queen Anne actually turned out to be a, a pretty big area. So I'm making my search. I could hear like the fire crackling and, you know, I'm saying, I was like, well, is, is, is it over my head or, or am I hearing it back by the door? And kind of when you're doing that and you're alone and there's no water, you know, there's no water on the fire. You know, things can really get out of hand pretty quickly on you in a, in a Queen Anne. So, like, I start crawling out, and as I'm crawling out, Captain Down is coming up the stairs, and he turns to me, goes, "You got a primary on, on, on the top floor?" I said, "Well, I didn't get the whole thing yet." And he goes, "Get, get, get back in there! Get back in there!" And I was like, I turned around, I went back, and then, and then like having him with me, it's it's a little different when you have someone else with you. And we searched, made a search, and it turned out the search was negative, but. Like I said, when I would tell this story later on, I would always tell it in Downey's presence to other people. And I said, the moral of the story is almost like an Aesop's fable is that I was more scared of Downey than the fire, you know? And he was like, get a smile, get a little smile out of him. Like, I'll let me take it away in a second. Uh, that will listen to this in the audio version and won't watch it on YouTube. There, Kevin Shea is being lowered on that rope. And Kevin Shea, it doesn't matter what gear you're wearing. He could have had all the protective gear in the world. You fall from a height like that, at, at best, and I use that lightly, you're going to be seriously injured. At worst, you're going to die. So there's so much pressure there. You knew how to do it, but even then, it sends, as you said in that clip, shivers down your spine. Getting in there and not even having time to think, do you think that's what helped you in this rescue? Um, I don't know if that helped me in this rescue. Uh, <laughs> when I got up there, one of the things that was interesting is that not everyone had a harness back then. Uh, for some reason, I was working the day they were giving them out, and I got one. Uh, Kevin had one, obviously, but not everyone had the uh, harness. So I actually thought I was going to go over because I didn't know what was had taking place and when I walked up there that all went on before I got there so uh when they looked when I asked uh Lieutenant Brown at the time do you need any help and uh, I actually thought I might be the one going over because I had the harness but it turns out they wanted me to lower Kevin so I basically jumped into that role and I also knew that the rope was not connected it wasn't uh, tied off at the other end which is part of the safety procedure because it had been changed. It had been revamped because we had experienced a, a double fatality with two firefighters up in Harlem. And um, so they had redone the whole rope. It was it was treated like a very, it still is to this day, treated as sort of a very sacred piece of equipment. 
uh, and each company has one. The engine has one and the ladder company has one. So uh, Patty Brown was in charge of it. You can see, obviously, it takes more than two people to do, to do this. And, you know, it was basically the highlight of my career without realizing it maybe that day. But, you know, I know so I've had so many firefighters talk to me over the years about how it that whole rescue inspired them and to be firefighters and i fully understand that you can hear the applause of the people in the street uh after the rescues were completed and what a lot of people don't know is that was a recording studio that was on fire and the smoke you know we kind of had like a wind driven fire there in a sense because you'll notice that the smoke comes in and it goes out and it changes direction and it was extremely toxic smoke um, uh, climbing up the stairs a couple of levels down. You could smell it. It's just all rubber and plastic burning off the wires and uh, very nasty. And, you know, the rescue, we, we were assigned, I was in ladder 24th that, that day and we were assigned, I believe as an extra ladder company or the second ladder company. I'm not a hundred percent sure. And um, so you know, we were there. To, it turns out we, I was there and I ended up assisting them. It's usually just the opposite. Usually the rescue might be assisting, uh, you know, the regular company. But, uh, yeah, it was just a, an amazing event. Uh, you know, unfortunately, some of those firefighters aren't with us. Some of them were killed on 9-11. But that day is an iconic day for the FDNY. And it, it put us on the map so to speak, uh, because it showed, uh, you know, bravery. There's plenty of, obviously, uh, firefighters are brave all the time, but I think it just put on display our last-ditch effort to get someone, and and that's what that rope is all about. It's like the last way to get someone, and we did it. We did it twice, and uh, it was very successful. So uh, 1994, I was a bar commander in the Bronx, and uh, we became aware that there was going to be this concert in upstate New York. And I liked the good music and I, I liked the, uh, the environment and the atmosphere. And so I tried to involve myself in the uh, operation. And by do what I mean by that is I communicated with the folks that were planning the event, Woodstock. And I said, listen, I have some vacation time. I can take leave from the city. I'm a paramedic. I'm a chief officer, special operations background. I have a lot of experience planning for and managing these events. I'd like to offer my services to you, right? And uh, essentially, I was rebuffed. And they said, you know, thanks very much. If you want to work as a line paramedic, you know, we'll be happy to have you as a volunteer paramedic in, in the mud. That's fine. But uh, we don't need any leadership or anything like that. So, uh, you know, thanks very much, but no thank you. So I said, all right, guess that's not going to happen. You know, I'll watch the movie afterwards, right? Uh, a couple of weeks before Woodstock, uh, I had contact with a gentleman who worked for the State Department of Health who said, you know, we're going to need some help monitoring our health department permit. The state health department in New York issues a permit when you have a mass gathering over 5,000 people uh, that stipulates that you're meeting the medical need requirements for the, the people that are there. So uh, they said, we're going to look for some help to monitor that permit. Would you be interested in coming to help us? And I said, sure, happy to do that. Because if we get me to the music, I would be happy. I don't have to work or get my hands dirty. Just keep an eye on things, no problem. So I went up there a couple of days before the concert started. I'm on vacation. I relaxed from the city uh, work and I check in up at Woodstock. I'm going to be staying in a trailer there. And uh, they introduced me to the Hired Guns, uh, a private company that was hired to manage EMS for Woodstock. So I got to spend about 12 hours riding around with the, uh, the leaders of that organization. And uh, that night we had a meeting, myself and uh, Ray Florida, a colleague of mine, paramedic school colleague who is running the ambulance service at the time, Rockland Paramedics. I uh, just recently retired. And uh, they were the contract ambulance service and the state health department. And the state health department official said, uh, so what do you think? And I said, you're going to have a real problem. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, these folks really have no idea what they're in for. They have no organization. Their entire workforce is volunteer. They don't have communication set up. They, they don't have any idea about incident management. And this is going to collapse as soon as something happens here. And they said, to Ray Florida, what do you suggest we do? And Ray said, I think you should put Zach in charge. <laughs> so uh, so they asked me if I would do that. And I made one of one of probably the hallmark mistakes of my career because I didn't say, sure, here's a contract, just 
pay me this much and I'll be happy to do that. But instead I just said, sure. So, <laughs> so, uh, so with no pay and no, no charge, uh, I said, uh, I need you to give me all the resources that they have, put that in my disposal and I'll organize it. So, uh, so what then became our process over the next 18 hours was we brought everybody together who had any kind of supervisory background with resumes, built a communication center, organized teams and divisions and groups, implemented incident command, gave people assignments and created an EMS system for Woodstock. And so uh, we went through a number of challenges in, in 1994. We had rain, we had mud. It was very much like the first Woodstock. We had uh, um, uh, port of sand surfing when they were sliding the port of sands down the hills. We had uh, literally three days of, of caked up mud and no bathrooms. And it, it was a, a very interesting environment. And we ran our EMS operation through that with a workforce of about 400 volunteers, uh, which whittled down to about 150 by the time we were done. And I should say it traded down to about 150, but we got the job done. Uh, we had 5,500 patients in five days there. And, uh, you know, for, for, for that week, it was the third largest city in New York State. It was just Woodstock. And uh, fortunately, uh, I think we had very, very little loss of life. Uh, we were successful. We had a medevac operation, and um, it was a, absolutely an extraordinary experience. And our team, everybody did well, and uh, we went left there feeling very proud of what we did. Woodstock yeah, 94. It's difficult sometimes to put this in perspective. It's one thing to verbalize it. It's another thing to write it down because there's so many stories from that day. What prompted you to write that book? After, really after 20 years. I had a lot of time to reflect on what took place and and everything I did that day is either on video or audio tape. So um, I don't have any secrets. It's all there in, in, in public. Uh, but I wanted to walk people through what it was like that day, what it was like for, for me and my firefighters and, and the days after. Um, and I, Pick the title Ordinary Heroes because after 9-11, people asked me, how do you define a hero? And my definition of a hero is one who does ordinary things, but at an extraordinary time. And that's what we saw on 9-11. And that's what we see every day as our first responders run into danger. And um, we're not superheroes. We don't leap buildings in a single bound, um, but we'll run into danger so others may live. And that's why I entitled it Ordinary Heroes and take people through the story of walking in my shoes, in my firefighter's shoes, that day, the days and the months and the years after, and, and what that feels like. And... Um, and what it means to lead, that the, the heart of crisis leadership is the ability to, 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 to uh, sustain hope by unifying effort to solve complex problems in the face of great tragedy. And that's what we did then, and that's what we to, do today, whether we're looking at, at mass violence, um, in the United States and other parts of the world, or we're looking at the effects of climate change and, and dealing with wildfires and, 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 and hurricanes or many other disasters. It's, it's only by unifying our efforts can we make a difference. And it is our ordinary heroes um, that will make that difference today as well as they did yesterday. The fire department that you left in 2002, we talked a lot about the evolution of the FDNY tonight, right? The fire department you left in 2002 is so different than the fire department you returned to in 2014. I imagine that first day as the fire commissioner, you walked into your office, you had to look around at the operation and say, holy crap, in a good way, of course, you guys have come a long way. Tell me about getting reacclimated to such a different, more well-rounded, really high-speed department—one that really adapted well to the 21st century. I, I think it uh, 
a tribute to the members in that interim period that you know, took on these various roles, especially for uh, chief officers and some of our, uh, our civilian uh, personnel, personnel managers, um, that you know, upon themselves to move the department forward, whether it's with technology, whether it's with tactics, whether it was expanding training, uh, all of these things really were improved. I think we realized with the McKinsey report after 9-11 that there were certain things we could have done better. Um, and, and the members corrected many of them. Now, as commissioner, my role, you know, your, your role was more uh, administrative and encouraging the chiefs from the chief of department on down to um, continue the work that they were doing of, uh, of making the changes in the department that makes us more efficient. So um, the technical part of it, uh, I left to them. I never tried to be a fire chief as commissioner. I never responded to a fire and said, uh, step aside, you know, I think I'll I'll take command here. That's not the role of a fire commissioner. Even fire commissioners like myself from South Casano, who, you know, were chief of department at one time. Uh, your role is is different. You can observe, you can see who who may be uh, more efficient, who's who's the best for this role and who's the best for that role. But um, don't try to be uh, the chief officer. You're the commissioner. It's a different role. 2004. I mean, that was like that was the pinnacle of my career. You know, it's uh, you know, um, it's something that I never thought was going to happen to me. It just kind of fell into my lap, you know. And uh, um, you know, uh, June 12, 2004. Um, um, Bobby Engel, uh, Tree Trio, uh, Dispatcher Three Three O in the Bronx starts rescue three out on uh on a fire um i forget the exact address on brooklyn boulevard but uh it sounds like there's going to be a roof up rescue right from the get-go you know he sounds you know it, it sounds bad and uh you know we start out over there and uh, um uh chief Cargan from the one seven is uh acting deputy chief that night and uh you know we pull up kevin williams is the boss in rescue three and and i got the rope and uh, he says, "Rescue three, I need you on the roof. Uh, it looks like uh, it looks like there's going to be a you know roof up rescue up there." And uh, you know, we walk up the four story uh, adjacent, get up on the roof. I look over, uh, I see 42 trucks setting up a, a, a roof up evolution. I go over to the firefighter. I says, "Are you good? You know, um, you know that's the way we were on rescue three. We didn't step on step on anybody. A gentleman's rescue. We made sure that they knew what they were doing." Yes, I have it. I look over the shaft. You know, he's got it. I look over the shaft, and uh, there's two different people hanging out the window. And uh, there's a there's a male hanging out of one apartment window, and it's a female. The evolution that they're starting uh, starting on. And uh, so the uh, the bulkhead's on fire. We have nowhere to tie off up there. And Richie Bailey's my my partner. Um, I look over at Richie and. Uh, I said, hey, Richie, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to be going over. And Kevin Williams is right there by me. And uh, he says, where are we tying off to? I said, we're not tying off. I said, you know, you, I'm gonna, you're going to take the turns on your hook, and uh, I'm going to hook in, and uh, we're going to go over. And um, basically, it's, it's an open shaft, um, if you will. I know it's kind of kind of hard. You know, it's, it's, it's like this. You know, it's an open shaft. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a lady – over here and there's a guy here and um this evolution is is going um you know the guys the guys in in the loops um getting ready to go over and uh we're setting up our evolution um no substantial object and um i won't name the company or the firefighter but he steps out of the loops uh where the lady was and um Pat McKenna from uh, Rescue Three steps in the loops. Um, you know, somebody's got to go get this this lady. And at the same time, uh, there is a picture of both of us sitting on a parapet. Um, you know, it's from a distance, shot from an adjacent building. 
and uh, we both go over the side of the parapet and we pick off uh, uh, a male victim and a female victim. Um, according to Kevin Williams, and he was the senior uh, 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 guy in sock when he retired, forget how many years uh, he had. Um, he said it's the first time a simultaneous roof rope rescue took place. Wow. Yeah, it was a side by side, you know, I mean, you know, you can look back, you know, with uh, with Patty Browns and Kevin Shays and, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, um, that was a tremendous, it was a high profile job. It was a ballsy job, excuse me, you know, but it was, you know, that's what it was, you know, but at the same time, you know, uh, this one went off without a hitch, you know, like, um, you know, it's, it's training outside the box. Um, and, uh, and, you know, me knowing how to do this, it started back in 19 truck, you know, to go over without a substantial object. And we train on it as sock firefighters, you know, um, um, but Steve Luisi, um, that's the captain of 44 truck. He was a covering boss, you know, bouncing around the Bronx, uh, as a Lieutenant. He was a great guy. You know, he was always training, training this way, training that way. And he covered a lot in 19 truck, you know, he always wanted to. You know, he wasn't too much on building inspection at the time, you know, but, uh, um, you know, he's like, let's train, you know, let's train, let's train, let's train. And uh, always training outside the box to know how 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 to do this. And, uh, you know, like he was there with me, not physically that day, but mentally he was there doing this, you know, with me to make sure that it went right. And uh, amongst, you know, with with the team I had on the roof, because it's. You know, they say dope on a rope, right? So Patty and <laughs> yeah. Patty and Jeff are the dopes on a rope, you know. But at, at the same time, the brains that are, you know, setting up the evolution and lowering the guys are there. They got to know how to make it work. But um, anyway, um, you know, I get I get a medal for this uh, uh, on medal day, and I'll just speed forward on that real quick. Is just because Stevie Luis he's there at Gaelic Park, and uh, you know, I just you know I went up to him, I hugged him, and uh, you know, we're, we're just talking and uh, I'm like, yeah, you were there with me, brother. You know, you taught me this, you know, and, and that was a big, that was a big thing. It was a big sense of, uh, of accomplishment. You know, like, you know, I came to rescue three, October 5th of 01. And I think that we really proved ourselves that day, you know, that we could, as a unit, we get to operate. It's not just me and Patty, it's a unit operating and we made it work, you know, and I, I think that was, and, it, it, you know, that year uh, in 2004, uh, Danny Foley uh, made a, a confined space uh, rescue. Um, it was uh, I had a guy was caught in some type of fuel tank. He was in the fuel tank and he was overcome by fumes. And, and Danny made a, a brave rescue. You know, he went in on air, um, you know, with the, um, the dark cart that we had, you know, like breathing air, you know, because you can't wear an SCBA in there. You got to have like a confined space air. And uh, anyway, he goes in and he makes a rescue. So rescue three that year um, made three high profile rescues in 2004, you know, and uh, I don't know. You think you think somebody from downtown or the mayor's office would have seen it, you know, and say, hey, you know what? This is this is a good thing. You know, like what, what these guys are doing, you know, I mean, it's it's showing that the department is moving on you know and uh with all that experience that we lost and we'll never gain that experience back again but they are operating you know to you know to uh to a high standard if you will i was you a chief fire marshal uh we had the protocol on how to take care of firefighter uh bodies bodies of of, of plan to deaths and uh the protocol started actually with how it's safer and John Drennan. Yeah. Watch right. Street. Uh, and Watch Street. I, was, I mean, I was the commanding officer of Manhattan at the time. And uh, Howard Safer used to visit Drennan in the hospital in Burn Center. And he said to me, Louie, you know, and we had done the fireworks task force with, with the commissioner that had me do the fireworks task force. So I was familiar with, with Safer. And like I said, Safer understood law enforcement. He did. Um, and he said, when, when, when John's running, we have to take care of the body when he passed away. He's, he's, he's going to pass away soon, in other words. And he said, uh, we're going to have to take care of him with dignity. And I said, I'll take care of him. We're going to treat him with dignity. So 
So I get word they pass away. So I go there with a couple of teams of fire marshals. And we're going to transport the body. Now, my idea was to transport the body, and we would have a uh, an escort. And then the fire marshal would stay with the body overnight. They would be there to be identify the body and witness the autopsy. Okay? Which is what they do now. All right? But that wasn't that protocol had not developed yet. Uh, so here I am in the, in the, in the hospital, the burn center, and the morgue wagon comes. All right. So I said, uh, all right, you're going to, you're going to, you're here to pick up John Brennan, the body. I said, the firefighters, said, yeah, we're going to, we want to go directly to morgue and under escort. We're going to escort you to the cars. And the guy said, and the fellow says, me the driver. I mean, he, there's nothing wrong. You know, he didn't, he's not doing anything wrong. He's just following his procedure. He said, no, I have to get, pick up a floater in the Bronx. I said, you what? I said, no, no, he, this, this is a, this is a, a line to be death. We're going to take He goes, no, no, I have to go to the Bronx, pick up a floater. I said, well, show me the back of your rig, you know, the, the, the wagon. And he's got bodies piled up on the floor, on shelves, on the side. They're all in body bags. And I'm saying, I'll tell you what, we're not going, we're not putting him in there. We're not putting drugs right in there. So I said, you can go. Just go ahead and do what you got to do. Uh, then I approached the EMS boss that's there, and I said, I want to commandeer an ambulance. If you want to go to the morgue, we have a line of duty death, an honored firefighter, an officer. We want to take we want to take them to them to uh, the morgue for an autopsy, which is the, is they have to do that by the way, mm-hmm. by law. Uh, and he says to me, "No, we don't transport bodies." That's what the the the, 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 board, the EMS boss says to me. I said, are you sure you can't just do this? You know, he said, no, no, it's not, it's not part of our protocol. I call up Safer. And I said, Commissioner, this is a situation. Someone has to intervene here. Sure enough, he intervened. And guess what? The ambulance took John Brennan's body to the morgue and under escort, fire marshal escort. Right? The fire marshal kind of. We're very flexible. We're not stuck to a firehouse or a rig or overtime. We, you know, we, we have cars and we're able to, we have a lot of flexibility. So we escorted him and fire marshal stayed with him. That was the that was the protocol that's been followed ever since for any line of duty death. The fire marshals go to the hospital, take care of the body, make sure it's cleaned up with the medic, chief medical officer, uh, which was Kerry Kelly during my time, and the safety division take, collecting clothes and masks and whatever they have to equipment and we got we take care of the body and i would i would if i was there i would take bring the family if they wanted to see the person i would bring the family there to look take a look at the uh the body if it's appropriate depending on the shape of the body uh and and you're in the room i mean i'm in the room with, with the mayor and everything and, and i assure them that their loved one will be taken care of with dignity very important for the family to hear that. You know, you find out how important it is. And different families take things differently. It's, it was, you know, uh, but that became our protocol. And then to this day, that is the protocol. I guess that's the final thing that we could hit on before I get to the rapid fire. You know, we talked about it off the air. Let's get into it a little bit on the air about the counseling because peer support now, I love, there are a lot of, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, not to sound like a broken record. There's a lot of negative evolutions within society occurring right now, but one of them that is a positive is we're talking more and more about mental health, which is so good, especially for first responders, police and fire. Even though you guys love what you do, you saw so many things that nobody should ever have to see. And most people in a lifetime, thankfully, never do see. And that's not always easy. And guys have a hard time with it. It affects their family lives. It affects their personal lives. And you've been so active with that, helping members of the service, which is so awesome. So, so tell me about how you got involved with that. It's actually a funny story. Um, when I got out of the job, I was doing fire safety consulting. I was working for a company that did high-rise fire drills and high-rise office building. This is all predicated on the Triangle Shirt Waste Factory fire. All these laws came in after that horrific fire. And uh it was local law five mandated high rise buildings to do fire drills and have log records and so on and so forth. 
So I did that for five years. And all the while I was doing that, I kept making calls into the counseling unit to try to get an interview to become a peer counselor. And uh, he'll rename nameless, but I was using a friend of mine's name who was at the counseling unit. And uh, unbeknownst to me, him and the guy that was running the counseling unit, never they didn't really get along. So every time I name dropped this fellow's name, I never got a phone call. So I'm doing fire safety consulting and a friend of mine is uh, once a month, they do uh, they do uh, once a week, they do uh, an AA meeting at the counseling unit. And a friend of mine was speaking at the meeting and I was a fire safety consultant. He's like, why don't you come down and have lunch and uh, watch me share? And I, I Since then I have quit drinking as well, but at the time I was drinking and, you know, so I went, I saw the uh, the meeting and then afterwards, we're standing on the curb outside and two fellas pull up who are peer counselors. This guy, Dave Gettins and uh, this guy, Joe Donovan. And uh, at the time, back then, they were, they got a department car to drive around to the firehouse. So they got out and then we shook hands. I introduced myself. My friend Jimmy had known these guys. And uh, they said that, hey, you know, that they're, they're looking for guys. So I'm like, I've been trying to get a foot in the door for five years. So they said, call him right now. So I called up and, and Frank Lito was upstairs and I had never met the guy until this day. And I said, yeah, Frank, my name is Ronnie Caraba. I'm interested in, uh, you know, trying to become a peer counselor. He goes, well, you have to come in, you know, come in and sit down with me. I says, I'm outside on the sidewalk right now. He goes, well, come on upstairs. So I went upstairs and I sat down with him. And one of the first things he asked me was, where did you work? I said, I worked in Ladder 107. He goes, my father was a lieutenant there. So if I would have known that 10 years ago and said 107, I would have got my foot in the door five years earlier. But yeah, as everything happens for a reason. And I ended up uh, getting into uh, the peer counseling unit uh, as a peer. And uh, in the beginning, what I did, the first time I ever went out, um, it was with two guys who were peer counselors. And I would mirror them, just watch them. We go into a firehouse and we pitch the firehouse. We talk about drinking, drugging, family problems, and so on and so forth. And uh, we had discussed earlier before we came on on the air that uh, you know they had a suicide awareness program. They have all these different programs, and um, you know this whole thing about mental health. Um, there was a time in the New York City Fire Department when the counseling unit was a dumping ground. They just got rid of problem firemen, put them there. They were, after 9-11, they really came into their own, you know. They saw 10,000 family members after 9-11 and helped countless, countless, countless firefighters in, in, in all ranks, every rank, from the probie to chief of department and anywhere in between. Uh, all, all types of uh, personnel have been through those doors for different things. And, and if you think about the premise, it, it's a wonderful idea in the fact that I walk like a duck, I talk like a duck, I quack like a duck. I walk into a firehouse kitchen, it's instant credibility. Oh, you taught me in the probie school. Hey, we got on the job together. We got promoted together. So you, you, first of all, us as peers, we're in our own environment, the firehouse kitchen, right? And uh, coming from guys from within the job or personnel because there's female peers now and now actually the job has full duty firefighters and company officers that are peers because if the need is immediate they can go to the diamond plate look on the roster of all the guys working throughout the five boroughs and locate peers that are on duty at that very moment and they can get them to that area as quickly as possible where, where the need arises. But, um, you know, uh, it, the premise is right there, you know, and, and, and the guys, we pitch them, we talk about what is the programs that are offered to them. And we leave business cards on the table and we wish everybody to have a safe tour. And usually as we walk out of the kitchen on our way out to the firehouse, that's how we, we get people. They approach us. Hey, listen, uh, and it doesn't have to be the member's problem. It could be his wife, adult children in his household. We, 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 uh, the, the council unit paints with a broad brush, you know, and they'll, they'll help out a lot of different people within your family if, if it fits the narrative. But uh, it, it, 
and our job as peers, I make it very clear when I'm pitching the firehouses, I have the same degree as you guys in this kitchen, you know, chopping onions and breaking shoes. You know, I, I, I'm not a clinician. I don't have any kind of mental health background. I'm just a messenger. And I speak from firsthand experience. When I was on the job, I, I used the counseling unit for myself. And I, I, I was dealing with uh, my brother who had a drinking problem. We had lived together after both of us got divorced. I didn't know how to handle that situation. They gave me the uh, knowledge and the information I needed to better equip me. And then uh, in turn, you know, later on in my life, I had to come to the realization that, you know, I, I wasn't doing so good with the drinking. And I, I used the counseling unit and uh, they helped me along with that as well. You know, so this whole idea, we did have that podcast with the mental health show and um, it's getting that, that elephant out of the room, you know, the stigma. Because there was a time on this job, if you went to ask for help, they would put a CD30 on your locker, which is a transfer paper. You know, you don't have what it takes. Get lost. Go somewhere else. You know, it was that kind of an atmosphere, right. you know. But now uh, we're, we're trying to make it, it – it is acceptable. But a, a lot of people are worried. You know, if I come forward and say I have a drug problem or an alcohol problem, they're going to, I'm going to get canned. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my career. And the beauty of this is, is if you go willingly and you ask for help, you are protected by law. They can't fire you because you're asking for help, you know? So I'm, mean, there's, if you're a repeat offender and, and there's, there's certain fireable offenses, but I'm going to say well over 90%, 95%, if you ask for help, you're going to get help and your job will not be in jeopardy unless you put it in jeopardy. So that's a reassurance that we try to, to let firefighters know when we're pitching a kit, you know, we're talking, we let them know what's available, what, what you can expect. And, and just to have an open mind, you know, uh, we talk in, in terms of, you know, you tell a guy you know, pitching a firehouse, yeah, yeah, hey, you have a problem with your shoulder you go to an orthopedic guy if you're having chest pains you go to a cardiologist if mentally you're not prepared and you're not a hundred percent you have to address that because while you're on duty you have to be fit for duty across the board physically and mentally if you if you if there's something eating at you that's going to prevent you from doing your job you have to come to that realization because you know there's five positions in the truck and there's five positions in the engine if one guy doesn't do their job that affects the outcome of that operation because now one part of the puzzle or one part of that that operation is not being completed and 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 you're you, you become a part of the problem instead of part of the solution if, if you're not mentally prepared to 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 be a hundred percent you have to come to that realization and you have to ask for help it, and there's no shame in my game. I, I, I've i asked for help on the job and off the job. And it's, uh, you know, we're getting that, we're getting that stigma. We're getting rid of it. We're trying to. Yeah. Uh, one of the beauties of the Getting Salty podcast is I met a fellow by the name of Mike Matter, and he's a Dearborn, Michigan fireman. They started within the last year, they started their own peer counseling team. And I, I put him in touch with Frank Lido to pick his brain because he is he's the, uh, the the highest authority I know in, the, in that room. And uh, I don't know if they ever really talked, but I got to tell you, man, he hit, this guy hit the ground running. They, he's got a lot of posts going on and a lot of good, 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 positive feedback. So, you know, what, what once was a, you know, taboo is now uh, – it's on the kitchen table and it's, it's a talkable subject and it's something that uh, everybody's got to realize that if, if you need the help, you got to ask for it. There's a saying that goes in, in emergency services is, uh, you know, Lord help my mind, forget what my eyes have seen, you know, and what we do is cumulative. You know, we see it. There's another term called gallows humor. We see something horrific and we make light of it. That's in, in reality, you're dumping it. You know, you're getting rid of it. You, you just see the way that guy's leg was wrapped around it. You know, whatever it is, you talk about it and you're off gassing, you know, but the gallows humor thing, that, that can only get you so far, you know. 
And after a while, you have to come to the realization and there's people out there that can help you. So raise your hand, ask for help, and you'll get it. And and you'll be a better person for it. And uh, you go back to full duty and you can uh, live to ride that shiny red fire truck again and have the time of your life. You know, you're involved in something that really, you know, for me, you know, historic fires, you know, uh, when I was there. Yeah. If you want to tell me about them, that'd be good. Well, I think the, the, the first one that comes to mind is we had a fire. Uh, we were coming back from another job, and we we're on uh, Queens Boulevard, and we get a call for Gorsland Street, which is more over towards where 288 is. And uh, so, uh, ladder 126 acting to uh, 136 and 287 our first do it at this uh, fire. And uh, it was in a one story uh, in the front um, garden apartment, I guess you call it. Mm -hmm. And then, but it was two stories in the back. And uh, it turns out this, whoever saw this fire, they, they didn't do it on purpose. They were burning or they were taking out a, a boiler in the basement and they, there was a fireplace in the basement and uh, they were, they lit up these oily reds in the fireplace or got out of the fireplace and uh, got into the ceiling of the basement. And by the time we got there, there was no second new truck there. The uh, uh, place was rolling. It, was like, it sounded like a freight train. Heavy black smoke coming out the front door, just chugging. And that was from the time I got off the rig at the corner and walked, you know, 150 uh, feet light, light smoke to Rome, like a freight train. So um, the, the, the thermal imaging kind of couldn't see, couldn't see anything. Yeah, I was holding it up to my face like this. Couldn't see nothing. That's how thick the smoke was. Um, my irons man was inside. Uh, it had burnt through the uh, door already. Uh, a couple of guys from uh, 126 are in the basement. Um, one gets out, and then the stairs burnt out away. The officer went to the rear of the building, found refuge there. Um, my irons man took a door off an adjoining room pushed over the opening and then uh, the engine gets burnt. They're making their way out. So they push me out of the doorway. I look into a side window. I see a hand hanging out the window and uh, turns out it was the boss from uh, 287. He got turned around. Um, his, uh, we managed to get him out. And his hands were completely burnt, just really bad, you know. And then uh, that fire was, that was one of those one, one fires where um, it had not been for the guys doing what they did, meaning the roof man is on the roof, cut a hole right over the over the, where the stairs were for the basement. So now all the smoke lifts up. Uh, we ended up going in, the stairs are burnt out. We ended up going in through the back door with another engine, uh, found the lieutenant uh, there and put the fire out, you know, and uh, uh, the lieutenant from, you know, 280, 287, he, you know, he survived. Never went back to work, but he survived. You know, you know that was a good thing. That was one of those times where um, they had, uh, the chief wanted to write me up and, uh, I got the phone call from uh, the lieutenant uh, thanking me, and that was better than uh, getting a medal, as far as I was concerned. You know, I'll say knowing no. that you did your job. You know, you got the guy out. You know, every everybody went home after that one. And that's a good fire, and everybody goes home. I ask yeah. you, of course, pre nine eleven that you can recall that was either a great citywide job or just a great Bronx job while working in three. Um. Well, we had collapse wise. There were some, we, we did, um, the, uh, highest high angle rescue 
uh, that the job had done since they had trained guys to do high angle rescue. And I happened to be fortunate enough to be working that day. We had a um, injured worker on the Wards Island water tower. And um, uh, his coworker ran into the fire academy on, on Randall's Island and ran into the house watch and told them what was going on. And uh, they sent us, and this guy had a, a back injury and he couldn't move. Um, so we went up there and immobilized them, put a collar on them, backboarded them, lashed them into Stokes basket. And um, uh, two of the guys uh, rigged a high point, at the top of the water tower. And then we, we lowered uh, the patient and uh, John O'Connell, who was uh, a fireman of rescue three lowered him as the attendant with the uh with the patient that was pretty interesting and it was there was a comical side to it as well because that morning at the change of tours not comical that this poor fellow got banged up and had to be lowered off the tower but uh change tours we're having coffee and one of the guys who uh, uh was like a rope guru he he was always teaching rope stuff at the academy and he was really really into the rope the high angle rope stuff. And uh, he walked into the kitchen and he was now off duty. And I don't know what he was saying, but finally uh, our lieutenant that was working the day shift uh, looked up at him. He said, hey, you've been off duty for a half hour now. Why don't you get the heck out of here so we can go out and do a high angle rescue? <laughs> <laughs> so he left and like, I don't know, an hour later, we're going out the door and they're telling us it's a confirmed high angle rescue. <laughs> <laughs> we were crying, laughing in the back of the rig, going to this thing, saying, wait till he finds out, man, he's not going to be happy. Um, and that was another unit citation. That was number two out of the three that I got in the whole time I was on the job. Um, but that was a great team effort. Um, just uh, uh, it was uh, rescue three and ladder 14 and uh, squad 41. And we were all on the same um uh what you call it unit citation they listed all three units all on the same unit citation and it was uh it was seamless it it really uh everybody worked well together and uh um very successful incident and i didn't realize it at the time but the our lieutenant told us later that it was the uh the highest um to to that date, it was the highest uh, high angle rescue that our job had done since they had trained everybody for it. So um, that was a good feeling, you know. I'll, I'll ask a question, both of you, just so we can end on a, on a, on a real good note, uh, and then we'll get to our shout outs. When you look back on your careers, obviously there were some tough moments. Hank, you mentioned some. Ray, you mentioned some. Great careers, though. Great people you worked with, great companies you worked in. And I'll start with you, Ray, and then I'll go to you, Hank. What are you proudest of when you look back on your careers? I, I think that I, I was most proud that I was able to teach young guys in the firehouse, drill new guys, teach them the ins and out of the minutia that of, of what the firefighter has to know to be a good firefighter. And then finally to um, be involved in uh, teaching, be involved in the rescue school, be involved in teaching at the uh, National County Fire Service Academy. Mm -hmm. Uh, those were great days. You got to deliver the message. People were happy to learn from your experience. I think teaching ended up being like the most rewarding part about having spent the time I did in the fire service. Hank? Um, you know, the, 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 my whole career was a high point. I have to say I, I was, I was blessed and fortunate to have worked in, uh, all great companies, you know, getting out of Proby school, going to 280 engine and going across the floor to 132, uh, you know, rescue one, uh, even made a, a stop in 175 and then 288. I mean, it was, it was, they were all great places to work. I learned from great guys. And, um, and then like Ray said, being able to, to pass those lessons on, whether, and I started in the volleys in Freeport, um, you know, and to give back to, you know, through, through teaching, whether it was, um, you know, on a Sunday morning in the Freeport Volley Firehouse or teaching at the Nassau County Academy, having the, having young probies, you know, not, not probies, but having 
young guys uh, coming into the squad um, and even teaching. I, I did some back to basics at the new uh, FDNY Academy. But those, those are all high points. You know, and then there's the certain days maybe you were involved in a rescue or something, um, you know, and, and it gave you a good feeling to be able to, you know, make a difference and, and, and uh, you know, give somebody back to their family. That's always a high point. And, it, and, and that's good for your family and, it, and it's good for, the, for your company because, it, you know, it's, it's a sense of company pride. If one guy does it, we all did it. So, um, you know, so again, being fortunate enough to have been involved in a couple of those. Um, and, and like I say, you look back, I miss it dearly. Um, you know, it's, you, you, we're, we're all beat up. Ray will tell you, you know, like, you, you know, I'm waiting for, you know, a, a knee and I got to get the shoulder fixed and, you know, we got some lung issues and stuff, but it's, it's not, if I could turn back the clock and do it all over again in 79, knowing what was ahead, I, I would do it all over again. It's just, if there's something to be said when you love what you do, when you get up, Every day, and you don't have to say, "Oh crap, I got to go to work today." You love doing what you're doing. Um, you know, you're never going to be a millionaire, but that's worth a million bucks. Dispatcher flowchart. Dispatcher flowchart. Okay, this shows you how information is received and processed in a uh, dispatcher's office. Okay, calls come in from 911, ERS boxes. They come in from private fire alarm companies such as like ADT, Rapid Response, USA Central, and uh, companies like that. They all go into the alarm receipt dispatcher. And the alarm receipt dispatcher talks to the caller, verifies all the information, and also filters out a lot of the stuff. You know, firefighters don't go up and pull cats out of trees. And we told people, listen, we're not sending a fire company out for that. If you want to go knock on the firehouse door, okay, fine. And, you know, they start getting really, you know, like belligerent and stuff. I'm like, all right, listen, take a can of cat food, put or tuna, put it at the bottom of the, you know, bottom of the tree. The cat will eventually come down. So it goes from the alarm receipt dispatchers there, ARD, to the decision dispatcher. The decision dispatcher looks at the alarm, makes sure the right amount of units are going, the right type of units are going, and they send it out. And from there, it goes to the firehouses. You know, tone alert goes off in the firehouse, ticket prints up on the computer. Now, in the event that doesn't happen, it goes to the voice alarm. And the voice alarm is an intercom system between us and the firehouses. You can pick one specific firehouse, a group of firehouses, or just hit a button and you get the whole borough and you would make the announcement. You know, I'll I'll give you an example, like, you know, attention engine four, three, ladder five, nine, respond, phone alarm. Box 4723, 20 Richmond Plaza, Sedgwick Avenue on 176th Street for a CO detector activation, apartment 1480. 43 and 59 acknowledge. 4359104. That's a telephone alarm. It's a 5 7 signal. The box is 4723, 20 Richmond Plaza, Sedgwick and 176 for a CO detector. Your timeout is 2015. After, I think it's 90 seconds, it goes to the radio for announcement. So, Telephone alarm, the box is 3538, reporting the address, 183 West 238th Street off of Bailey Avenue, reported to be a fire on the second floor. It's a telephone alarm, the box is 3538, 183 West 238th Street. It's off of Bailey Avenue, reported to be a fire on the second floor. Units going into box 3538, there is SIDS information available, available upon request. SIDS information is critical information dispatch system. We have a database in the computer that tells us if there's things that firefighters have to look out for when it comes to fighting a fire in that particular building. You know, you'll, you'll have a height of the building, the dimensions of the building. Um, if it's what they call an H type building, or if it's an old law tenement type of building, or even if it's just, you know, a two story frame construction building, you know, 20 wide by 40 deep, your typical New York city private house. And there'll be information on that building, you know, things like, you know, pit bulls in the backyard, um, heavy clutter condition in the basement, uh, vacant building, holes throughout, exterior operations only. Um, so if there's something on that building the firefighters need to know, they'll ask, you know, engine, we'll just use that particular box. It's 81 engine 46 truck for us deal. You know, engine 81, hey, could you give us the SIDS information for that building? 10-4, stand by. You'd pull it up and you'd read out the SIDS to the units responding. 
Um, and sometimes you would have a situation. We had a situation in Manhattan one night. It was a, uh, it was like a six story vacant. It was going up on like 139th street and like eighth Avenue. Units pull up, transmit to 1075 and they're scaffolding in front of the building. So they can't see the fluorescent, paint square with the x on it that shows a vacant building and they can't see the address either so one of the addresses the callers gave was such and such an address on 8th avenue so the dispatcher says to the the battalion hey listen i got sids on a building i don't know if this is where you're operating but i'm going to read out these sids and write out the sids you know six story vacant Holes throughout exterior operations only. All right, 10 4 Manhattan. We're pulling everybody out within like two minutes of them pulling out, you know, 20 guys out of the building. <laughs> whole freaking building came down. Pancake collapse ended up going to a third alarm. We're at the hour mark, and I, I know I, I said I, I wouldn't keep you too long. You mentioned being an instructor. You're also a writer. You've written three books. You've written in the FDNY training magazine. You've written in WNYF. So tell me how that came about, because it's one thing to verbalize thoughts in the fire service and transmit them to those that are under you, but it's another thing to write them down. And I remember having this conversation with Paul last year. It's almost harder because, as he joked, you want to make sure you put it in English. So tell me about writing. Oh, and, and you know what? To some degree, it is harder. But what's easier is you can write and rewrite and edit and look at it and modify it, and then somebody else can look at it and help you with it. When you talk, you talk. It comes out of your mouth. Sometimes, like a lot of politicians learn the hard way, sometimes it, sometimes it's hard to take the words back after you say them. But uh, I started writing. Harvey Eisner, God rest his soul, for Firehouse Magazine, he used to ride in Rescue 3 when I was a young firefighter. And, and eventually he said, hey, why don't, you, why don't you write an article? I'm like, me? He said, yeah, write an article for the magazine. Make a long story short, eventually he sort of talked me into it. I wrote something basic about something I knew, something with the saw. And, and that led to another article, to another article. And I sort of started doing it maybe a couple of times a year. I don't remember the frequency. Uh, eventually, I got promoted lieutenant, and I kept doing that, kept writing articles for him. And then he invited me to go to the Firehouse Expo in Baltimore, which was the show, back in the old days of the slides, you know, the little the little cardboard slides that you had actually put into the, into the round uh, projector and all that. Uh, and one thing led to another, led to another, you know. Eventually, I thought, gee, a book would be interesting. And my first book came – came via Vinnie Dunn. Uh, it was after 9-11. It was 2002. It was, it was, it was published in 2003. Uh, a printer went to Vinnie Dunn and said, listen, there's a lot of leadership books out there, but leadership by Robert E. Lee, leadership by Abraham Lincoln, leadership by the Marine Corps. How about a fire service? How about a, a fire chief's leadership book? And, and Vinnie Dunn told me, you know what? I'm working on another book right now. I got a lot of books. And he, and he gave them my name. And they came to me and said, would you like to do that? And I did. So that was my first book back in 2003, which is actually still in print, uh, first in, last out, Leadership Lessons from the New York Fire Department. Still one of my one of my most favorite. I, I enjoy the book. I still like it, and it's one of my most popular books. Uh, and then after that, it sort of bit me. I said, oh, that was good. And uh, then I always wanted to write an engine book. After I was the captain of 48, you know, go look at all the books that are written. A lot are written about technical rescue and roof operations and truck guys and mustaches and halligan tools and all the truck stuff and there's not many engine books written i said i want to write an engine book and i and i did and i and i wrote the engine the engine company which uh i, I was happy with the results of that uh then my friend uh rick lasky a good good friend of mine i travel around and, and teach with him a lot he's a retired chief from uh, down in texas we wrote a leadership book together my third book uh five alarm leadership which we both added a a two cents into it and came out with a, with a nice book. And actually I just wrote another book and it just came out. I just put it on Facebook the other day. It's called the, the, the fire scene and it will be published and available December 20th through fire engineering uh, books. And that is really just an accumulation, a collection of my articles. I write the back page of firehouse now every month. I've been doing it for almost 20 years. And I, I took the best and the brightest articles and I, I categorized them by topic, and I made, I think, 13 or 14 chapters, and that's the new book. So it gets easier. Like being an officer, it gets easier the more you do There's it, right? always the growing pains of a new unit, and you kind of touched on it now. 84, 85, 86, you're trying to get off the ground and trying to make people and understand it in the city, not just residents, but obviously the higher-ups in the fire department, those at, at City Hall as well. This is why we're here. This is why you need us. 
uh, it's tough, but it's a beautiful thing when you look back in hindsight and you see, well, just that, the infancy stages and what you had to do and the fact that you were doing more with less. So when you look back on those first two years, what were the biggest challenges, but what were the biggest rewards? Well, there were a lot of challenges um, internally within the within the house. We were put into a house with a uh, it was designed as a double house, but only had a single engine. So we were taking over a lot of their space. So we we really had to work with them to get them to accept us and and understand what we were trying to deal with, and we had to understand what they were now accepting. All of these and you know thirty nine other people coming into the house and taking over most of their space. We had to work out the small issues in the firehouse, like commissary, and cooking and and uh, cleaning uh, issues with all of that, but we were also doing a lot of training. So we weren't always there. They, the engine was really great. They picked up a lot of slack for us. Um, we were out all the time. In fact, one of the things we tried to do in the beginning was everybody was going to put a dollar in uh, a pool every time you worked. And the first crew, uh, crew that went to all five boroughs in one 24 hour shift would get the pool. Nobody ever, won. nobody ever won, but <laughs> We were uh, dealing a lot with new equipment. We, of course, had some basic equipment from the second piece that came to Hazmat from Rescue 4. Mm -hmm. Rescue 4, of course, was doing the first Hazmat response uh, from about 80 to 84, 81 to 84, after the incident with the LPG tanker on the George Washington Bridge, which started the whole process up. Um, but we needed a lot more equipment. So what we really did, uh, and, and I'll give credit to Captain Gallagher, the first captain, and the, and the three officers we had. We had uh, Joe Jordan, whose son is the staff chief now. We had um, jo um, John Calderon, who retired out of battalion, probably one of the longest serving battalion chiefs that I'm aware of in the job. And uh, Joe Buell, both of them coming out of Rescue 4. Uh, but they, they took each of the members of the company and assigned us something. Phil McArdle was in charge of looking for schools to attend. Uh, somebody was looking at level A ensembles. I was looking at level B ensembles. John Norman was there. Uh, he was uh, he had a background and knowledge in plumbing. So he was looking at all of the equipment that we needed on the apparatus. We had Chris Waters there from Rescue 3, Noel. He was a chemical uh, chemistry teacher and uh, later on became the uh, chair of the chemistry uh, training program down at the National Fire Academy. Uh, he helped with a lot of the training and set up for us. And we, we had a tremendous amount of people in that first group. There were 60 volunteers f to sign up to try to get into the company, and they picked 35. You know, when one of the guys, Billy Bulkerman, was a pesticide uh, applicator out in the on the island so we we had a wide variety of uh talented people there uh vinnie doherty had a degree in chemistry kevin cully had a degree in chemistry um so we were able to portion out the workload to really try and get up to speed with some of the uh few other hazmat companies around the country jacksonville florida was one of the first ones if not the first one uh, houston was up there too we had a lot of catching up to do and and uh, the team pulled together quite well but it was challenging we also had the issues at the top getting as you say getting the chiefs to understand uh, this is not a fast process and i still say it to this day i don't know of any hazmat team that's ever saved somebody Life safety is done by first two companies. We're going in to try and mitigate the material from affecting other people, to try and contain it, neutralize it, put it someplace else. And um, it's, it's a slow process. And because there's no life safety usually involved except our own, it should be a slow process. Taking the time to think about what the issues are, uh, to sometimes taking samples and and moving them around and testing them in the street before you can take an action. I can remember one of those we had in Brooklyn. A man had a contract company. He was a salvager that would purchase the contents of buildings that had uh, where the business had gone out of business, and uh, he had a new contract that he needed to uh, have some empty drums to go and collect the stuff out of the uh, new 
new building and he had a drum in the back of a it was a five bay garage that he owned behind a row of homes in brooklyn and uh, we accessed it through an eight foot wide alley he had a drum of bags of sodium chips metallic sodium chips <clears throat> And he took he took the bags out and was throwing them on the ground so he could use the drum. One of the bags broke open and ignited with the moisture on the ground, the dew. They're, it's very reactive with uh, water, moisture. And he tried putting it out with a garden hose. It got a little bigger, so he stopped putting water on it and <clears throat> started spitting back at him. It's, it's like uh, even probably more reactive than magnesium when we deal with magnesium fires on vehicles. And the uh, first two units came and they saw fire. So they took out a hand line and put water on it and it got worse. And then they decided to smother it with some sand. <clears throat> so we got there and we took some samples and we, Kevin Cully was uh, one of the ones, a chemistry degree, played with it in the street. And we determined it was metallic sodium. So we had to overpack it in a drum. The two of us went in. And we over we put in some absorbent oil dry, then a bag, some another layer of oil dry, a bag, another layer. We got to the last two bags and we ran out of oil dry. So we figured we would use the sand from the same pile that the first two units had used to smother the fire. Except now we were digging deeper into the pile of sand and we got some wet sand, wet sand and put it on the second to last bag. Before we could lift up the last bag to put it in, the thing pretty much exploded out of the can. It reacted that violently with the wet sand. And um, we, we, we had a lot of learning lessons like that in the early days, a lot of challenges. Uh, the, the cutting edge of the Firestorm had moved to the Bronx, the North Bronx, where we had these big apartment houses, Grand Concourse, giant apartment houses, combustible interiors. So we were struggling learning how to do those. We now know how to do those each type of fires. But uh, anyway, so he said, no, thanks, but the borough command is going to write a whole big thing. So now, okay, so at least I knew I could, you know, I, I just took stuff from all over and put it together. And I talked a little bit about my fire, but it was really like a study thing for me. So then I go on with my life, learning to be a deputy the Bronx and there's a lot of fire, many more fires than any place I worked. And uh, so uh, one day I relieve this uh, veteran chief up there <clears throat> and he said, yeah, we had a tax rate, third alarm fire in, in Manhattan last night. And <clears throat> we would respond to North Bronx and Manhattan. So he said, uh, the power wall collapse. As he's leaving, he's leaving the fire. <clears throat> so one line he tells the power wall collapse. So we do all administration work that morning. So I said to the driver, let's take a ride over and look at Harry's fire. I go, well, I go over to drive over to Manhattan to this fire with a row of stores. The parable wall had collapsed into the street. There was four feet of stone for a hundred feet on the sidewalk. I am shocked. I said, wait a minute, the call headquarters, get me the photo unit up here. Give me a pad and pencil. And I'm going to start to draw this. I want the photo unit to photograph this wall that came down in a wave. You know, uh, one part of it came down and it was all tied together with iron bar. It was a it was a cast stone, parable wall with an overhang. Came down in a wave. So uh, I wrote this article. I, I had to write this. Uh, I write about parable wall collapse. And in the article. You know, I'm now a deputy. Now I start to think about uh, a fire I had in 23rd Street where 12 guys got killed. Now I'm saying I got a responsibility here. I'm the deputy. So uh, I got to make sure my firefighters don't get killed with collapse. Now that thing that was post-traumatic stress that had come out on me as a deputy. I never thought about that after we got this fire where 12 firemen died. I've been 10 years, 11 years later, I'm a deputy. Now I'm thinking about this collapse. So now I see this parable walls are recurrent collapse danger. I write this article. And as I write the article near the end, it's, well, who is responsible when guys get killed at a collapse? I said, who is responsible? I said, well, the, the incident commander, the deputy, 
the buck stops with him. He's the, you know, he's the final responsibility. However, at a big fire, I assigned a sector chief, another chief officer, sector two, sector three, the rear, sector four, the right side. And that sector chief is responsible for that sector, the lives of the firefighters working in that sector, in their sectors. And the company officer who's operating around this fire is responsible for the firefighters in his unit. And then the firefighters are responsible to listen to the company officer and follow his direction and not freelance. So I'm not saying the ultimate responsibility is the incident commander, but there's, there's shared responsibility with sector officer, do we call them division officer, sector chief. There's shared responsibility with company officers and there's shared responsibility with firefighters. One man can't make a fire scene safe. One chief can't make that, but the team of sector chiefs, <clears throat> company officers and firefighters do what they're supposed to do. That's how safety comes about in the fire service.